Um, yeah, so I'm Galaxy Kate. Um, you can find me at pretty much anything at galaxykate.com. I've got a total dumpster fire of a GitHub repo, also at Galaxy Kate. Um, the slides for this talk are going to be, um, I'm going to go pretty fast. So the slides from this talk are at um, galaxykate.com slash PDFs. Uh, I'll show a lot of uh, random apps that I've made, and those are at galaxykate.com slash apps. And you can just find a bunch of stuff of mine at galaxykate.com. Um, so a little bit about me. I did five years on Spore and SimCity. Um, if you ever played Spore, I did the planets. Um, I'm now six years into a PhD in generative games and creativity tools of all types. Um, this is at the Expressive Intelligence uh, Studio at UC Santa, uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, also, can I make a pitch to the conference organizers to have decaf? Because I had caffeinated this morning and we're all going to be the worse for it. Um, <laughs> life is hard for the chemically sensitive. Um, I've done some contracting on chatbots for the Google Home, um, and I released that open source as the Bottery Finite State Machine platform. If any of you all saw the really excellent uh, Finite State Machine talk earlier this morning, here's another take on it. Um, yeah, I made Tracery, a language for generative bots that currently runs about 6,000 active bots, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, I make generative art bots, games, art tools, and more, and I like to teach other people how to do it. So you know, here's a um, projected head that I've done. Um, I really like the Leap Motion and Leap Motion Works. Um, I've done procedural dance generation. Um, here's some generated butterflies. Uh, this is a little generated train travel through Europe game. Um, and then this is just some flowers doing attractive things. So yeah. Um, so my talk today um, is about generative art, but like, why should I bring this to a JavaScript conference? Um, it's because a lot of my favorite generative art pieces, both my own and of others, they're interactive. There are things that people can touch and play with. And this is true of a lot of interesting generative stuff. Um, we've, we've all worked with generative art if you've used a pottery wheel. It's sort of mechanically assisted creativity. Um, everything from spire graphs to knitting can kind of fall into this category. Um, you may have feelings when you see this. Um, if, did anybody use Kidpex as a kid? Well, not so many people. I wonder if it was an American thing, but this is like a generative creativity tool from the very late 80s um, that got me started on this. Um, but you can generate pretty much anything. Um, I've made tools for people, but I've also gotten to see a lot of people making interesting things, every fr everything from music to poetry, industrial design, uh, generative cocktail recipes. Um, so these are uh, the top one is a, or it is a pottery generator, there's a necklace generator, and a music generator at the bottom. Um, but you can generate things like tensegrity architecture, which is a form of architecture that couldn't exist before computers could help us uh, generate it. Um, this is some work by a group called um, Nervous System, and they do generative dresses um, and generative necklaces. But these are all interactive prototypes. You can actually change how the necklace looks before you get it 3D printed and sent to you. Um, you can generate... Uh, here we go. Um, these are two projects by NASA to do procedurally generated stuff with genetic algorithms. So um, if you represent a radio antenna as a bent piece of metal, you can represent that as a string of DNA uh, for each radio antenna, decide how well it's going to perform. Ha the successful ones have lots of babies, and those babies have babies and are judged. Uh, and they got their best ever radio antenna off of that, which looks like a bent paperclip, but it's a very specifically bent paperclip. Um, later on, they used that same method to figure out how to make a tensegrity ball walk. Uh, this is something that no human could program, but it was you know, the, the ball that wobbled the best um, got to have many babies, and then its babies had babies, and eventually you get something that sort of lurches. Um, here is a hot rod uh, that is procedurally generated. Um, the chassis is something that no human would design, but a machine could design it. Um, there's tools like Grasshopper 3D that make interesting parametric models. Um, you can kind of 3D print these out in interesting ways. Uh, there's a woman named Bathsheba Grossman, who's actually in Santa Cruz, where I am, um, who does mathematical 3D generated models that are 3D printed out, um, sometimes quite large as art pieces. Um, you can generate things with particles. So these are strange attractors, which are imaginary swarms of particles orbiting uh, in a strange way. Uh, some sort of gravitational body, and then you can map their trails onto 3D geometry and print those out. Um, you can print things using grammars. So grammars are a way of recursively sticking objects to other objects. So this is a bot um, that trolls Thingiverse, which is a 3D printing site, grabs objects, glues them together, and then re-uploads them as art. Um, the community is very uh, confused as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I use a lot of parametric particle-based generations. So these are fabric generators that I've made. Um, and 
These are all in ca uh, Canvas, uh, processing or Canvas. Um, some of them are SVG. Oh, I uh, did put little symbols of the technology that I used um, for all the ones that are mine. Uh, I uploaded these to a website, and you can now buy them as T-shirts. Um, I made a version of this that um, generates the, the fabric um, patterns and then prints it out on Spoonflower. So I'm currently wearing a JavaScript-made skirt. Um, one of the swags I have are JavaScript-made um, uh, scarves. Uh, so yeah, there's that skirt. Um, you, know, of you can, of course, generate all sorts of things. You can uh, generate animations, games, textures, um, all sorts of things for games. So here's uh, one of the creatures that I made when I worked on Spore. Um, but then the, the skins of the creatures, so if you have this 3D model and you want to texture it in some way, you can procedurally unwrap that creature, even if it's a dynamic creature that the user has made that you've never seen before. You can unwrap it into this sort of skin here. Um, and then the way we texture these creatures was actually with particles, where if you imagine you have a white horse, but you want a zebra, uh, you spawn black paintballs on top of it, drop them on top of the horse, they stick to the back of it, they roll down, getting smaller and smaller as they go, and you get this sort of stripe pattern. But then if you put like a VW minibus or any sort of object underneath that and run the same script, you'll get something that has like zebra stripes, even though you didn't know you wanted zebra stripes before. Um, there's lots of video games that do procedural content generation. Um, I don't think any of these are in JavaScript. I think they're all in Java or Java likes. Um, but yeah, these all do procedurally generated levels. So you can kind of, if you have a, a game, JavaScript or non, you can make infinite levels to run through. Um, you can generate stories. So this is Minecraft, um, not Minecraft, sorry, uh, Dwarf Fortress, um, which simulates years and years of geology, sociology, ecology to simulate 3,000, like 10,000 years of dwarvish history, and then it puts you in the middle of it, and you can kind of procedurally excavate um, as gameplay the history of this world. Um, you can even generate game rules. So this is um, a work out of, I believe, NYU um, that generates an adventure game dynamically. Um, this one is generated game levels. Uh, this is a project called Refraction, um, and it uses procedural generation not just to design the levels, but actually verify that the levels are unbreakable by players. Um, and then you can design games themselves. This is Yavalath. This was also a genetic algorithm um, that could design systems of rules, kind of like Go, where it's like one piece can move like this, and you capture another piece like this, and the game board looks like this. Um, generated thousands of those, generated the players for them, had the players play the games, and then picked the ones that the players made the most interesting decisions. Uh, and then they produced that game, uh, gave it a generated name, and sell it in stores. Um, so you can generate pretty much anything. Um, a common phrase, or a common sort of theme with PCG talks is often, oh wow, you can save so much time and money generating things, um, and you don't have to hire artists anymore, won't that be great? Uh, this actually doesn't work that great. Um, you won't get robot artists. But, instead, um, you can have art that's made from user input. So you can have, like in Spore, we had the users creating these complex creatures, and then we could dynamically, like on a millisecond level, um, skin them, texture them, animate them, and so the player just feels like they're making like magical clay. And that's something that no, you can never have an artist sitting there modeling those, you know, millisecond by millisecond. You can have art that the computer and the users make together. Um, and you can have art that just goes on forever and ever and ever. Um, I make a lot of Twitter bots, and the Twitter bots, if you set a Twitter bot to posting and the service never goes down, it'll just keep producing content every n seconds. Um, you can even have an art space that you can explore mathematically. Um, I won't go too far into this, but these bot-made scarves are actually made with um, roughly 100 uh, sliders from 0 to 1. So each one has kind of a different position of sliders. And you can imagine uh, that those are vectors in a 100-dimensional space. Um, so if I have this scarf over here and this scarf over here, I can mathematically say what is the scarf directly in the middle of those. Um, so you can do interesting like uh, interactions with that. Um, and yeah, ways to interact with the generator. Um, there's a lot of different ways. These are a couple of the bots that are running on my, um, actually the sorting hat bot isn't running on my technology. Um, but these are bots that respond to people that at them on Twitter. So what do you do with, in, with a JavaScript generator? Well, you can have it talk to people. Um, so the one at the bottom left is like my bad comic generator. Um, and if you add it, it will make a little comic and say, hey, I made you this. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is an Ikea-themed Dungeons and Dragons bot, and you can um, tweet at it to have a little Dungeons and Dragons adventure. 
Um, there's lots of other really interesting ways to interact with them. Everything from, you know, I'm going to use my camera, like my, cam my, my face as input. Um, so the one on the bottom right is Apple. The one on the bottom left is me. Um, I'm doing a particle simulation that kind of draws these interesting rainbow things. Um, this form of inter interaction is really interesting because you get people kind of having this mask um, that moves, and they start to move their heads and bodies in really interesting ways. So if you've ever studied like mask or dance or costume theory, um, you can get people to move differently when you generate stuff around them. Um, the one on the top left is somebody who used tracery to uh, generate code, and then that code ran through a um, a dynamic creator of texture and or of animation and sound, and they use this to like uh, do a rave in London. Um, the one in the upper right is like kind of you have a gesture, so the user has made some sort of gesture, and you're doing something with that gesture. So that one actually is um, the one in the top right and bottom left are both running in JavaScript. Um, so the one in the top right is this is a uh, commission from a 3D printing company, and they wanted something such that anybody could draw a pendant that could be 3D printed out. So this is basically like. If you take one thing away from this talk, it's that symmetry is like the MSG of uh, generative art. If you have something bad, just put symmetry on it, and suddenly it looks a lot better. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can generate anything, like geometry, sound, texture, text, recipes. You can use it for any reason. You can make generators. So I know a lot of the people in this room or like at this conference might be like doing fairly, fairly serious like div pushing for large enterprise solutions. Um, but you can also just go home and make a, a Twitter bot in like five minutes. Uh, you can make something for an arts festival. You can make something to amuse yourself. <coughs> you can make something that has a political aim, um, or you can do it for fun or for fashion. Uh, but yeah, so how do you do it? So second half of this talk, let's talk about making a generator. Um, these are two art bots. Uh, the one on the left is from the 1700s, and it uh, uses cams to mechanically draw images. It's actually programmable, where you can like set the cogs in certain ways that it like writes text. Um, the one on the right is the watercolor bot from e Evil Mad Scientist Labs, where you draw in a window, and then it like has the robot draw it for you uh, with watercolors. Um, so yeah, these are two different things. Um, there's a phrase we used to use on Spore, which is called an artist in a box. So you're making, your generator is trying to be, like trying to have the mind of an artist, but you're putting it in a box and sending it to the user. Whether or not, you know, on Spore that was actually a shiny plastic disk, but now, you know, you're creating something that's going to run on a server. Um, so the idea is kind of, what are the virtues of your artist? Uh, this depends on what you're making. Um, this talk is always hard to give because, I've, as I've just said, you can make pretty much anything. So what does it mean to be a good architect? What does it mean to be a good storyteller on Twitter? What does it mean to like be good at, at having a conversation with somebody? Um, so you basically want to figure out those constraints about what must and must not happen um, and use those to build your generator. Uh, I have more about that in this blog post, so you want to build a generator. Um, so yeah, how do we actually build it? So um, I have this thought. I've built probably at least 100 various art generators of various kinds. Um, and out of all this, I've realized that generativity is a pipeline. Um, so up here are two fairly odd projects. Um, these are not mine, uh, but they're both out of design studios in Europe. Um, the and they're both taking brain waves and turning them into furniture. So you start with brain waves, and you're going to furniture. And they take very different paths to this. So what, the one on the left, um, you are put under an MRI scanner or a brainwave scanner of some sort um, and told to think about different kinds of furniture, uh, orange, blue, um, solid, like not solid, uh, round, sharp. Um, and it measures your brainwaves, and then it like generates a piece of furniture based on that. And they've made that guy that piece of furniture, and he hates it. And so it's art. <laughs> um, <laughs> The one on the right is it actually me measures your brain waves as the waves, and then it stacks up those waves and makes a piece of furniture out of it. But you're supposed to think of the word, word comfortable um, as it does. So like two inputs, two very like two inputs, two outputs that are the same, um, but the paths through them are very different. Um, so yeah, you have some inputs and some outputs. Um, I made so I make a lot of free tools and I open source them all. Um, this is a deck of cards that I made to help people think through how to make generators. Um, and they're called the Generominos, and you can print them out. Um, I have some decks of cards with me, but I actually, they're already promised to people. Um, but ask me tomorrow, I'll, I'll at least show you one. Um, the idea is that you have some inputs, so the, the ones with the blue stripe at the top are inputs. Um, so here's the connect, um, and this is basically the pipeline of data. Like, you can never turn data into other data um, without 
like putting an algorithm on it. So this was, why is it really hard to design for the leap motion versus like the DDR pad? Um, and a lot of video games take events and states as their input. So like um, the uh, sort of little beads on a string are events and states. Um, so a game pad will create events and states, like I'm holding down a, uh, a trigger or I'm pressing a button. And games are really good at taking those as inputs. So if I have a game pad, I can make a game, no problem. Um, if I have a, like a rock band guitar, that's producing events and states. And oh boy, I can totally make a game out of that. Um, if I have a connect, it's actually creating like a mesh of vertices. So like there's a bunch of vertices sort of floating in space. Well, how am I going to convert those into button presses uh, that my video game needs? Well, you kind of have to have the detect gestures one. So it's like, OK, I'm going to turn this set of vector data into press button A, and I'm going to turn this set of vector data into press button B. <coughs> I wanted to do a project that had kind of a different approach to that. So this is um, a project I did called Idle Hands for an Arts Festival. This takes sleep motion data, which is vector data, um, and then runs a Voronoi algorithm on it, which takes vector data and turns it into triangles. And that was pretty much all I did. Um, this had my best ever review, which was from somebody who was fairly chemically altered. He thought his hands were stuck in the screen. Um, not in a bad way, just in a way that he had to like sit with for a while. Um, so this is kind of the generominoes. Uh, the, these are two different ways of documenting on generominoes. Um, but yeah, like basically, you get the particle data, you run a Voronoi diagram, you triangulate the regions, you draw the polygons, and then you project it on a screen. Um, so this is kind of ways to think of how data wants to transform into other data. So yeah, it's kind of a pipeline, um, but I want to show you the Lego bricks that you're going to use in the pipeline. Um, this is basically the like tools you can use section um, if you've ever wanted to generate something. And these are kind of the, the big ones that they fall into. Um, so there's grammars, which is one of my favorites. This is like you're making things out of other things. Um, I have this language called tracery that I made, which is basically like writing in JSON these recurs recursive recipes. Um, because it's JSON, which is fairly safe, somebody actually made a node bot or like a node service that hosts these JSON files and posts them to Twitter periodically. This is the one that's currently running 6,000 bots. Um, this is one of the earliest ones. This is hipster cocktails. And you can kind of see the recipe for making a hipster cocktail. Um, you know, it's got a name, it's got, you know, um, combine some liquid with some other liquid, put in something, and um, maybe make, uh, like, yeah. Um, somebody also figured out that because this generated text, uh, what's a kind of recursive text? SVG HTML. And so <laughs> because I like fun JavaScript things, um, I had just been learning JavaScript at that point, and my online editor had used um, .html in jQuery to fill in my divs uh, instead of .txt, or .text. And so everything you put in would be parsed as actual HTML. And so somebody used, figured out that you could do SVG with that. And then suddenly we had art bots. Um, so yeah, these are a couple of things that I've made with tracery and SVG. Um, these are some art generators, uh, spaceship generators. Um, I made a, a Taika Watiti outfit generator because he wears really out awesome outfits. Um, you can also do tiles, which is the idea that like, if I have something that is split up into even sections, and I can kind of put things into this section. If you've ever played Settlers of Catan, where you have like this grid and you're putting tiles randomly on it. Uh, that's kind of using tile-based things. But um, Diablo was one of the first games that kind of used this for map generation, and you can totally not see that those are maps up there, but they are maps that somebody has documented. Um, this is one of the oldest ones. This is an example of um, using tile-based music. So this is not only generation or generativity from the 1700s, it's IP infringement from the 1700s. Um, this is not actually by Mozart, but it, the publisher said it was. Um, and this is called dice music. And so you roll some dice, and then you pick out the measure, and you like put a bunch of measures together. So it's like a mu if music is kind of a grid of measures, then you can just like paste in the tiles of new measures. Um, parametric is another one that I use a lot. This is basically the idea that you have um, a lot of sliders as seen up above. So this is a flower generator that uses 32 different sliders. Um, and I can do all sorts of fun stuff like um, I can actually control this with music, or I can control it with hand gestures, um, or I can have the, the user navigate it in different ways. So the one at the bottom is you're just picking the flower that you like the best, and you're sort of procedurally evolving them. Um, there's kind of a whole class of ones that are like geometric transformations. Um, this is something like you've got a curve. You going to play? OK, cool. Um, so the user has made some sort of gesture, either with your hand or with a mouth, or mouth, mouse, 
um, or with whatever input you've got. Um, you could do it with a mouse, that would be interesting. Um, and then you're gonna take that curve and do something interesting along it. So a lot of these techniques are kind of like, you have some input, I want you to exaggerate and riff on that input in some way. Um, so the one at the top is IO brush. You can uh, use a webcam to sort of slurp up images, and then you can paint them along a curve. Um, that's about maybe 12 years old by now, but at the bottom is tilt brush, which you're drawing curves in 3D, and then they've got all sorts of, like a whole library of interesting stuff that you can do along that curve, like glitter effects and particle effects and animations and like sort of different stuff. Um, here are a couple of works that I've done in curves. Um, these are the one at the top is how I generated these scarves, um, using these curves and making interesting SVG along them. Uh, the one at the bottom is actually a like motion thing where you can draw with your hands and then it makes kind of interesting living uh, curves out of it. Yeah, let's see. Um, oh, here we go. Here's one that like takes curves and draws floral patterns along them. I, I really don't know what I'm doing with a lot of these. Like I just kind of decorate the curves and then figure out an interesting form of interaction for them. I don't know how to interact with the flowers yet. Uh, but here's a really good example of using that. Uh, this is actually a gallery piece. Um, come on, play. Here we go. Uh, this is called The Treachery of Sanctuary by Chris Milk. Um, and you would have these sort of monolithic mirror projections. Um, and as you extend your arm, it takes the geometry of your arm and extends it out into wings. So this is taking like a small scrap of geometry and making it something bigger and more expressive. Um, this is great because like you don't need to be taught how to do this. It's just continuously like shifting what your arm means. Um, distribution, this is a really common one. This is just like, I have a bunch of stuff and I wanna scatter it around. Um, so you can think of how things are scattered in nature. So like go outside and look at the lava fields and like see how rocks are clustered around other rocks and then the moss is clustered around those. Um, there are really interesting things to do with generativity in distribution in like alternate reality games. So if you have something like Pokemon Go, how are the monsters scattered around the world? Like what logics are you using for that? Um, you could have what they do, which is like where there's more foot traffic, we're gonna scatter more monsters. You could say like in every piece of land that was taken, by Native taken from Native Americans like before 1900, we're gonna put the monsters there and you're gonna actually like see where the landscape was defined. Um, so you can like make different choices about distribution. Um, you know, where do you wanna put things in your world? Is it where there's more pollution, less pollution, more people, less people, more car traffic, less car traffic? Um, particles and simulation, I do a lot of stuff with particles just because it's like, it's my personal favorite tool. Um, so the, the bodies up there are actually um, particles that are being pushed around by the music. So imagine like you create a dance because you have a little sentient tribble on your wrist and every time it hears a bass beat, it does that. And like you do another one and like, and then you apply those to your hips. Um, so you can kind of like create little dances out of that. Um, the one on the bottom left is Boyd's flocking, which is like how you create flocks of things that stay together. What can you do with that? Well, you can leave trails behind it. So these are actually little particles that are zooming around with their little physics pushes. Um, and I'm leaving tra trails behind them and that creates these kind of interesting 3D flowers. Um, I really wanted to mention machine learning just because like, what do you do with machine learning? Well, it's another part of the pipeline. So remember how I talked about we're turning curves into other things. This is you tell the user to draw a couple of curves and then you are going to run a little machine learning thing on it that for every pixel tries to make it look as much like a cat as possible. Um, and just kind of iteratively like for this patch of pixels, how do I like sort of wobble the pixels such that they look as much like a cat as possible? Um, so this is like procedural cat wobbling um, to generate that sort of thing. Uh, you can use it for more serious stuff. This is uh, Alex Champendard who's got a a startup now which is trying to do artistic stuff with um, interactive machine learning where you can like color in sort of MS Paint style and then it will, uh, just like with the cats, waggle the pixels until it looks as much like it thinks Monet should look. Um, so yeah, like a little bit, of, I wanted to talk a little bit at least about JavaScript because um, it's got a lot of features that are really well suited for generativity. I used to do processing. Um, then are about uh, 2012, I got contracted to teach a class in JavaScript, so then I had to learn JavaScript. Um, and then I got into processing.js, and that was just a huge life changer because I loved the functional programming stuff. Um, so you can like do maps and filters and reduces. Um, so this whole, like, it's a pipeline sort of thing actually works with um, kind of different uh, options in, in 
JavaScript where like you, you might have a user gesture and you're gonna turn that into curves. And then you're gonna turn those curves into like different stamped shapes or styled curves in some way. Um, you might have particles doing like a particle physics simulation. You can turn those into curves or into stamped shapes. Um, any one of those might turn into 3.js models or they might turn into like P5 canvas stuff or SVG. You might take that P5 canvas thing and turn it into a PNG that you're using in 3.js. Um, so here's like some physics sim that's um, pushing particles around and turning them into curves. Um, here's physics that are like procedurally unkinking the curves that the particles are making. Um, and then here's something where this project, I did a 3.js butterfly simulator and I'm using process, like I'm using particles and processing to draw the wings that I'm rendering to canvas that I'm sending over to 3.js as my textures. Um, so you can really set up these wild chains. Um, there's a whole bunch of different generative libraries, everything from Dancer.js to take music and give you numbers, and if you have those numbers, what are you gonna do with those numbers? I don't know, generate something. Uh, Voronoi, um, I've made these li libraries called Tracery and Bottery, but you know, you've got SVG, Canvas, 3.js, processing, um, all different ways to output art. Um, and then I really like how you can get different interfaces. So you can make stuff with Twitter data. Um, you can make stuff with big data APIs. Um, something that I didn't mention here is like, uh, visualization is a form of generative art. You are taking some data, you are running some interesting tools on it, you know, grammars or parameters or whatever, um, and you're getting some interesting art out of it. Um, I like the leap motion, even though it's kind of on the downturn now. It's like unpopular because nobody could figure out what to do with it. Um, you can do mouse gestures, you can do 3D printing APIs. Um, I don't know what people are gonna do with uh, augmented reality, but if you've got like, I'm gonna scan this room and do some augmented reality in stuff in it, I'm gonna need generative art to figure out like, what do I do with a table? What do I do with a table that's got like that arrangement of glasses on it? Um, you know, if I wanted to lay a generative garden over this entire thing, there are processes that I've just showed you that I could use to simulate interesting garden stuff. Um, but I could never have an artist sit here and like dynamically figure out what everything is gonna be on every table. And then 3D printing APIs, which are fun, but Spoonflower, which is the fabric printing one that I did, no longer has a, a direct API. You can still upload stuff to it, but like you can't have it dynamically respond to users' actions. Um, oh yeah, and that's uh, the kid using my um, idle hands thing. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion, um, JavaScript has a lot of good features. It has libraries, plays well with unusual interfaces. Um, you can make something that makes something. It's not hard to build these things. Um, one of the swags that I brought with me is um, I, I made a bot and my bot makes art buttons, or sorry, stickers. Um, so if you've ever made an art bot or something that makes what you consider art, come up to me and you can totally get one of those stickers. Um, if you haven't, come up to me later and I will show you how to use Tracery and in five minutes you'll have an art bot and then a sticker. So yeah. <laughs>